Hey, good morning, church. So good to see you in the house of the Lord on spring break weekend. Be sure to be praying for both of our student ministry teams. We have a team of our students. They're out in Boulder, Colorado, working with a new church plant out there called Pinewood Church, loving on that city and that neighborhood. And we have another group of students that are all the way on the other side of the globe in Egypt today that are loving on students in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So be sure to be praying for both of our student ministry teams as they're away today loving on folks in the name of Christ. And so, and thank you, Pastor Spencer, for that clarity on egg drop knocks. I, you know, I didn't know if we were having a Chinese buffet or what that was all about. This excites my heart. It stirs my heart because here's what we're doing with this deal, man. We are saying to our city and to our community, we love you. We're loving on our community, but we're also celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which makes all things possible for us. And so I hope you'll be a part of that. Pray that up. Matter of fact, we feel like that God is going to use this one event over over at the Christian Academy of Knoxville to reach thousands of people in such a way we've actually added an additional Sunday morning service just for those folks to come and be a part so there's a seat for them on Easter Sunday morning. So be sure to invite folks in your life to be a part of that event and also what's going to take place here on Easter Sunday weekend. Man, you picked a great day to be in the house of the Lord. We are wrapping up this message series and call Some Assembly Required. It's all been about relationships and how we want to build Christ-honoring relationships and the battles and the struggles that we find in this area of our life. And so let me kind of back up and review for those of you who are maybe just sitting in with us for the very first time today. So in week one, here's what we identified out of the Word of God, that you and I were created for relationship. First of all, with God, and then with each other. We were created for relationship. But man, are they ever messy. And they require continual maintenance, but it is worth it. When it's good, it's really, really good. In week two, here's what we identified. Our biggest problem in every earthly relationship is down deep inside of us, and we cannot fix it on our own. Own. We've got to deal with this thing called sin that started all the way back with Adam and Eve. We've got to deal with the me monster inside of us. And so our biggest problem in every earthly relationship is down deep inside of us and we cannot fix it on our own. In week three, here's what we said. If we find our worth or our value or our significance in anything or anyone else other than Jesus, our relationships will always struggle and fail. We realize we have got to find our significance in Christ, and our horizontal relationships are built directly out of our vertical relationship with Jesus. So that was the week following. And then last week, here's what we talked about, conflict resolution. Every relationship we have is a battle field and we'll always have conflict and we're always going to fight so we have to learn how to fight fair according to the word right no low blows you've got to attack the problem and not the person and so last weekend we we're talking about how do you and I have conflict with one another and come out looking like Jesus and so uh, what a great great time together today is the most important piece of all I'm so glad that you're here uh, it helps put all of these things together and give us a game plan for success, how to, to walk all of this out. So what's our goal today? To, to free ourselves up from unhealthy relationships moving forward. So the message today is called proper alignment, proper alignment. How many people have uh, hit a pothole somewhere on I-40 over the last couple of weeks? Isn't it crazy? I mean, what a crazy winter we've had. It's been hot. It's been cold. It's raining like crazy. The rainiest February ever in history of Knoxville since 1873. And so it's been a wild, crazy winter. And as a result, there are potholes everywhere. You cannot avoid those things. I mean, you're driving down the interstate 55, 65, 75, 85 for some of you guys. You're driving way too fast, and you can't get out of the way, and you, bam, you hit a pothole, and it knocks your car out of alignment. You don't know it at first, but over a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, what happens is that your car starts pulling a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, and your tires start wearing uneven. And after you keep driving this car that's out of alignment long enough, you know what happens, right? You get the steering wheel shimmies. You know what I'm talking about? 
I mean, your, your, your steering wheel starts to shimmy in your hand. You're like, what in the world is going on here? Your car is out of alignment. So you make an appointment, you take it to the garage, and you ask a, me- a mechanic, hey, fix this deal. I mean, I'm driving down the road. It pulls me to the right. It pulls me to the left. It's kind of like a dance move or something going on. It shimmies in my hand. And so the mechanic says, you know what you need? You need a brand new set of tires. And so it's going to cost you $800, $900, $1,000, $1,200 to put new tires on your ride, on your car, on your truck. And so the mechanic takes off the old tires that have been worn improperly, and he puts on brand new tires, but he doesn't take the time to align your car. So he gives you the car back. And at first, it is awesome. It's incredible. You got this new smooth ride. It's like a brand new car. It even smells like new rubber in your garage. Don't you love new car tires? And so everything's great for a week or two or three weeks or so. And you drive this thing maybe a month and it starts again. All of a sudden, you're pulling to the right. You're pulling to the left. What's going on? Your tires begin to wear unevenly, and you get back to the steering wheel shimmers because the mechanic never took the time to deal with the real issue and properly align your car. Now, so many of us are like this in our relationship, right? Life knocks us out of alignment. You hit a relationship pothole. And it knocks everything out of alignment. You have controversy. You have conflict. You have a struggle. And so instead of taking the time to deal with the deep issues in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, you just move on to the next relationship, the next friend, the next school, the next job, the next church, the next city, the next marriage. We just move on. But the problem is we still have this deep need for spiritual realignment in us. Because it starts when we're young. You go away to school and you meet a school friend and it's amazing. You have this great relationship with your friend, but then you have conflict in this relationship. And so you you step back and so instead of dealing with what's going on deep inside of you and your mind and your heart, you just say, you know what? I don't need you. I'll get another friend. And so you get another friend and it it continues on in your dating relationships. And you you have dating relationships and it breaks up and you carry it over into your marriage and everything's great at first until you hit a relationship pothole and it knocks things out of alignment in your marriage and you don't know what to do with this thing and so it's awkward and you start to drift apart and all of a sudden you just say hey this thing's not going to work for me I've fallen out of love which you can't do by the way you see I always say that that love is not an emotion love is a choice isn't it love is a decision you have chosen to love this person with all your heart And so you just end up, hey, man, we're not going to make it. And you have a divorce and you go into another marriage and and you carry those same things in there because you're out of alignment. So we need spiritual alignment, proper alignment. If you never fix the real problems down deep inside of you before long, you're right back in the same brokenness. So you say, Pastor, what is the answer to all this mess? How do I begin to build and live out Christ-honoring, healthy relationships that last. How do I properly align myself for joy-filled, long-lasting relationship? The key to it is this. You ready? The love of God. The love of God. You see, oh my goodness, when you come to realize, maybe for the very first time in your life, you begin to fully grasp the deep, unconditional love of God, it frees you from bondage. Because I believe all of us as Christ followers at some time in our life and in our journey, we have three spiritual strongholds in our life that impacts our relationships in a negative way. But when you come to grasp the deep, wide love of Jesus Christ, it will free you from the bondage of these three things. I want to show it to you in the Word today. Let's begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have a copy of the Bible, and I hope you do, join me there. Find it in the Bible. Find it on your phone. Find it on your iPad. Track along with us up on the big screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. By the way, that was really messed up. The church in Corinth was really messed up. They had all kinds of relational problems. But I want you to see what he says in 2 Corinthians 5.14. Paul says, For Christ's love, there's the key to the day, right? 
For Christ, love compels us. It drives us. It consumes us. The love of Christ compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. That's Jesus. And therefore, all died. Now look at verse 15. And he died for all that those who live, that's us, should no longer live for themselves. Time out, quick time out here. Do you see what he just said? The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for you and I so that we would no longer live for ourselves. Isn't this good news today? You don't have to live for you. You can live for other people that we should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, I want you to see these verses on the screen. The Lord Jesus is speaking, the red letters, in John 8, 32. He's talking about himself being the truth. And here's what he says. I need you to help me with this. Then you will know the truth, Jesus, and the truth will set you, say it out loud. Oh. Jesus said, when you know me in deep relationship, when you experience the love of Christ, it will set you free. Now look at verse 36, John 8, 36. So if the Son, Jesus, sets you free, you will be free indeed. It's the love of Christ that breaks the strongholds in your relationships. And I want to show it to you today as we walk together in the Word. You ready for this? So the love of God frees us from, number one, the bondage of self-righteousness. Would you write this down? You're going to need this in your relationships. Would you take a moment to jot this down? The love of Christ will free you from the bondage of self-righteousness. What am I talking about? Well, let's just be honest. In the past, We have been so hard to live with because we can never be wrong. Have you ever met that person? I mean, they can never be wrong. They can never allow themselves to be wrong. And you've been that person before. You've walked with that person before. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's a coach. You've walked with a person who has this bondage of self-righteousness where they can never be wrong. They can never lose a game. Why? Because they have associated their worth, their value, their likability, their acceptance, their respect, their love with always being right and never losing. Maybe you were a small child and your grandmother loved to play checkers. And so when your grandmother invited you to her home and she would play checkers with you and you would sit down and have this amazing little game of checkers, but when you lost, you would flip the checkerboard over in her lap. (laughs) Why do we do these things? Because we have something down deep inside of us. It's a bondage in us that we always have to win. We always have to be right because we find our worth and our value in being right. Maybe it's, men you're playing church league softball, bless God. I mean, everybody played church league softball, and you're just out there trying to have some fun. But you hit the ball three times in a row right to the third baseman. He catches you out, and the third time you lose your ever-loving mind. And what do you do? You take the softball bat, and you throw it like it did something wrong. You throw it against the fence. Church league softball, why do we do these things? Because we have this thing down deep inside of all of us that says, I must always be right. I must always win. You say, Pastor, you're, you're talking about this like you understand it. Hey, you're getting a little personal now. My grandmother forgave me, thanks the Lord. <laughs> but my softball team's still trying to deal with this deal. Thank the Lord it was when I was a kid. I mean, I did these things when I was a kid. I flipped the checkerboard over my grandmother's lap because she beat me in checker. Are you kidding me? I mean, I was in high school playing with my church on the church league softball team, and I did it. I lost my cool, and I threw the bat into the fence, and I thought, what an idiot. Why do I do these things? Because down deep inside of us, there's this inner lawyer that kicks into our lives. You see, we're never open to discuss real issues, problems. Oh, don't even talk about fault here. There's this inner lawyer that kicks in that starts guarding you, defending your self-righteousness. You would say things like, I dare you accuse me of that. Ever said those things? I dare you. Well, this inner lawyer kicks into you, right? Kicks into your your heart, into your mind, and you, you would say things like that. You 
we would say, man, I, I can't believe you made such an allegation against me. What is that? That's the need down deep inside of you for self-righteousness. You always got to be right. You always have to have the last word. You always got to win. You always got to maintain this righteousness down deep inside of you. And you know what happens when we live our life like this? We become totally unapproachable. Am I connecting to anybody? You're unapproachable. I mean, nobody wants to talk to you. They say, oh, I mean, don't waste your breath with him. Don't waste your time on her. I mean, she's just going to put up a defense mechanism. She's going to put up a wall. She's going to be self-righteous. She's going to always have to win. She's going to always have to have the right word. He has always got to be right. And so you become unapproachable. And nobody wants to be around you. And it's very lonely when you live in the bondage of self-righteousness. You say, Pastor, okay, I got it. Well, what is the answer? What do I do? Man, I'm so glad you asked. Here's the key to the whole thing. I have no righteousness of my own. Oh, could you ever get to that place where you understand that you have no righteousness of your own? Galatians 2.20, can we put it up on the screen? Look at Galatians 2.20. The Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, this is the key to the whole thing that every day of your life, you've got to die to yourself. And the only life you live is through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. We are crucified daily with Jesus. I live in the righteousness of another. And his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Right? You live in the righteousness of another. And his name is is Jesus. Listen to me. I'm not trying to beat you down today, but you have no righteousness of your own. None of us are worthy. No, not one. None of us seek after the heart of God. And you and I live in the righteousness of another, and his name is Jesus. He frees us. Jesus and his love frees us for them from the need to always be right, to always win, to always defend. He makes you approachable. He makes you likable. He makes you lovable. He frees you from the bondage of self-righteousness. When I was a kid, we would always sing, On Christ the solid rock I stand, All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is, is sinking sand. When you, listen to me, understand and fully grasp the love of Christ for you, it will free you, sir. It will free you, ma'am, from the bondage of self-righteousness. You no longer always have to be right. You no longer cannot lose you're no longer unapproachable because you realize that you have no righteousness of your own. You stand in the righteousness of another, and his name is Jesus, and it frees you. Hallelujah. It frees you from the bondage of self-righteousness. You got it? Got it? Good. Number two, the love of God frees us from the bondage of self-righteousness. It frees us from the bondage of relational fear. Write this down. The love of Jesus will free you from the bondage of relational fear. What am I talking about? You live your life fearful of rejection, fearful of abandonment, always needing the approval of others, always needing to please. You remember a couple of weeks ago I put on the board the need to please is a disease. Is it not? The need to please others is a disease and it will destroy you because you're never going to be able to please everybody. And if you happen to please everybody one day, I guarantee you'll never please God. The need to please is a disease. And so when you understand the love of God, it will free you 
from relational fear. What am I saying? My well-being, listen to me, my well-being is not based off of your approval, but in God's unconditional love. Oh, if you could ever get to that place in your life where you can say that to yourself down deep in your heart, right? My well-being is not based off of your approval but on God's unconditional love. I no longer have to be in charge of all my relationships. I no longer have to be in control. I no longer have to live in constant relational fear. I can now, listen to me, I can now speak the truth to you in love. I can speak the truth to you. It's no longer awkward. You know, it's no longer, no longer fearful. Oh, I'm going to lose this relationship. I'm going to, things are going to get out of control. Now I can have a hard conversation with you. Uh, my husband, my wife, my, my son, my daughter, my boss, my friend, I, I can have a hard conversation with you. I can speak the truth to you in love because I no longer am dominated by relational fear. You, you see in the picture here? Wow, without the fear of loss, rejection, embarrassment, awkwardness, the love of Jesus Christ will deliver you from the bondage of relational fear. Number three, stay with me. We're just peeling back another layer. The deep love of God will deliver you from the, the bondage of unrealistic expectations. Can you write that down? Unrealistic expectations expectations you no longer ask people to do for you what only God can do for you unrealistic expectations I have a definition of frustration anybody in this room ever been frustrated can we be honest Trent? raise your hand frustrated frustrated or rest you are lying right now <laughs> what brings about frustration in your life why do you get frustrated I'm going to tell you why. Every time, it's an unmet expectation. You expected she was going to do this for you. She didn't. You, you expected this was going to happen at work. It didn't. You, you expected something. You had a deep expectation of a thing or an event or a relationship happening this way in your life, and it didn't happen. And when it didn't happen, you got frustrated. So my definition of frustration is unmet expectations. And see, as long as we are looking for other people to do for us only what God can do for us, we're going to have unrealistic expectations. We're going to live in constant frustration. Baby, I need you to complete me. I need you to fulfill me. I need you to give me worth. I need you to give me value. I need you to fill me with joy. I need you to build me up. I need you to make me feel good about myself. No, 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 no. Don't put that weight on their shoulders. They are not capable of doing this thing. The last time I checked, there is no fourth member of the Trinity. Right? There are only three seats, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all three of these seats are fully occupied. Your husband, your wife, your boss, your pastor, your friend cannot be God in your life. They cannot complete you. They cannot fulfill you. They cannot fill you with joy. They are incapable of doing this because they're human and they're flawed just like you. And so what happens is so many times in our relationships, we, we have these unrealistic expectations. And when our friend or spouse or boss doesn't meet these expectations, it leads us to deep frustration. Well, I need someone to love me and honor me and respect me. Yes, you do. Yes, yes, yes. But no human being can complete you or fulfill you. What do we need today? We need an appearance of Jesus. What we need, what you need, what I need, what North Star needs is an appearance of Jesus. I want to show it to you in Titus chapter 3. Will you go there with me? Little bitty book towards the end of the New Testament. Only three chapters, but power packed. The Apostle Paul writes this letter to this pastor named Titus. See, see Titus was a disciple of Paul, went with him on missionary journeys. They stopped at an island out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and Paul left him there. Paul says, hey, Titus, Tag, you're it. You're going to be the pastor of the church of Crete. How about that? You're going to be the pastor of the first church of Crete. 
and he left him there. And, and this, this island had all these people that had these broken relationships. And, and Titus was like, wow, what in the world do I do? So the Apostle Paul writes a letter back to his pastor friend, Titus, on the island of Crete. And here is what he said in Titus 3, 3 and 4. At one time, what is he talking about? Before you met Jesus, before you were saved, before you were full of the Holy Spirit, before you were a disciple, at one time we too, Christ followers, were foolish. Anybody ever been foolish in this house? I mean, we've all been foolish, haven't we? You were foolish. You were disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Look at the next verse. But, oh, I love this transitional word, this bridge. But when the kindness and the what? Say it out loud. Oh, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the deep, unconditional love of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, what happened? Look at this next part of the verse. Please. <laughs> Titus. <laughs> he saved us. Hallelujah. I should have had that memorized. He saved us. But when the love and the kindness of Jesus appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his what? His mercy he saved us. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, how many are thankful for the mercy of Jesus in your life today? The mercy of Jesus in your life. The mercy of Jesus in your life. Not because of the good, righteous things you had done, but because of the mercy of Jesus. There was an appearance Go back to verse 4, please, Claudia. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared. Wow. The Greek word here, appeared, is where we get this word epiphany from. Epiphanonis is the Greek word, epiphanonis. And we get our word epiphany. You ever had an epiphany? Like, you know, you're in the dark. And a light clicked on, a little light bulb, and all these thoughts come running in your mind. You're in a time of confusion, and you had a spiritual epiphany. An epiphany happened. And this is what he's talking about. When the love of God through Jesus our Savior appeared, and your world was in the darkness, but there was an epiphany, and Jesus showed up, and now there's light in the darkness. There's confusion and brokenness, and Jesus brought healing and restoration in every area. There was a spiritual epiphany when Jesus appeared on the scene. But as we go back to verse 5, it's because of his mercy. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking about grace. Oh, we're so thankful for the grace of God, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's the Greek word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, which literally is defined as unmerited favor. It's when you get what you really don't deserve. Man, we got the love of Jesus. We couldn't work for it. We couldn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. Grace, amazing grace is when you get what you really don't deserve. Now, I want to flip on the other side of the coin, and I want to talk about mercy because mercy is the opposite. Mercy is when you don't get what you really do deserve. Man, all of us deserve death and hell and brokenness and separation from God in eternity in a place called hell. We all deserve that, but mercy is when you don't get what you really do deserve. Anybody ever experienced the mercy of God? Mercy. You know, when you're a third-grade boy... I don't know why we do these things. We're stupid when we're in third grade. You go to the cafeteria, and everybody wants to know how they measure up, who's the strongest in the class. And so at the lunchroom table, you would put your fingers together like this, right? And, and you try to show masculinity and strength, and, and one would be forcing the other's hand this way, and the other one forcing the other. It's kind of like an arm wrestling match, and you got both hands. Like, and so until one person overcomes the other person, they bend their hands backwards so much that they cry out, Mercy! Mercy, I give up. Lord, have mercy in this moment, right? Mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is when you don't get what you really do deserve. Oh, thank God today for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy. See, the love of God appeared. He made an appearance, an epiphany in Jesus. And when Jesus came, he came showing you 
mercy. And when you understand the love of God to send his only begotten son, Jesus, to die in your place, to show you mercy, it will free you from the bondage of unrealistic expectations. Wow. What do we need today? We need an appearance of Jesus in this place. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says that God is rich in mercy. He has an abundance of mercy. He could dump it out on you. He could pour it out on your marriage, sir. He could pour it out on your family, on your sons and daughters. He could back up a dump truck of mercy and pour it out on North Star today. He could dump mercy all over the city of Knoxville, the mountains of East Tennessee. The Bible says that God is rich in mercy. He's not lacking in mercy. He has an abundance of it for you today. We need an appearance of Jesus in this place today that brings about his mercy in a fresh new way. Pastor, how in the world do I get myself properly aligned? I've hit a relationship pothole. And my relationship with my wife is out of balance. Pastor, I hit a relationship pothole the other day with my best friend of 20 years. And we're not good with each other right now. My relationship's out of alignment. Pastor, I hit a relationship pothole with you. And my relationship with my pastor is not really good right now. What do I do? How do I handle this? How do I move forward? How do I get properly aligned? What's the key to a healthy, biblical, joy-filled, long-lasting relationship. It is the love of God. When you fully understand the depth of the love of God, it will free you from the bondage of self-righteousness. You don't have to be right all the time. You don't have to win every game. When you understand the deep love of Christ, it'll free you from relational fear. Your well-being is not based off another person's approval, but in his love. You can speak the truth in love to other people. When you realize the love of God, it'll free you from unrealistic expectations and frustrations. You no longer ask people to do for you what only God can do for you. And I'm just going to tell you once again, you're never going to have healthy, horizontal relationships until you have a vibrant, vertical relationship with Jesus. It all comes out of this. I want to ask our team to make their way up. You can close your Bibles, sermon notebooks, but don't you check out on me, all right? I need to take you somewhere. What we do over the next couple of minutes may be the most important thing you do today, this week, this month, maybe your life hinges on what we do over the next couple of minutes. Every relationship you have today is hanging in the balance of what you do with these next few moments. Many of you have come every week of this series, five weeks we've been walking together and some assembly required. Pastor, I've got messed up relationships. I want to know how to make them right. I want to know how to build healthy relationships moving forward. You've been here every week. And you've heard me say that over and over and over again, that your horizontal relationships hinge directly off your vertical relationship. And the relationship, the relationship that matters the most today is your relationship with Jesus. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, none of this matters. None of this is going to work. None, nothing's going to change. No relationship's going to get better. Things are not going to be healed. If you don't have a vibrant, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, none of these things will work. It all hinges off you knowing Jesus deeply intimacy, walking in intimacy with Jesus. And so I want to just ask right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, all over the house, nobody looking around. 
And I've been waiting for this moment for five weeks. And so today, I, I, I want you to just draw a little imaginary circle around yourself. And I want you to begin to ask yourself the question, do I really know Jesus? Is he the personal savior of my life? Does his spirit dwell within me? You see, I've said this so many times, I'm going to say it again today. I, I love each one of you way too much to spend eternity in heaven without you. <laughs> and so I would want to say that there have been so many religious people whom I believe will miss heaven by 18 inches. Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the distance between your head and your heart. It's not enough just to know about God. You have to know God. It's not enough just to know about Jesus, to read your Bible, to come to church. You have to know him in a personal relationship. And so what does the Bible say about this? God the Father says, famous verse of John 3, 16, For God so loved, there's the word of the day, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, and that's you, believes in him, places your faith in him, will not perish but have eternal life. The Bible says that if you believe in Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus, that you'll live forever in his presence in a place called heaven. Jesus said in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 3, verse 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and have fellowship with him and he with me. What's he saying? It says that Jesus is a perfect gentleman and he loves you and he died for you and he wants to give you the gift of heaven but he's waiting on you. He's always the perfect gentleman. He'll never force himself into your life, but he's knocking at your heart's door today. Right now, you might sense it. Right now, your heart might be beating a little bit faster. Right now, your mind might be racing with this truth that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. This is God's promise, not mine and he's incapable of telling a lie. The Bible says today, if you will call on his name, he will forgive you. He will save you. He will fill you with his spirit. He will give you the promise of heaven. He'll give you a foundation to be able to build your relationships on. And so if you're here today and you say, Pastor, this word was for me. I want to know Jesus the way you know Jesus. I want to know that I've been forgiven of my sin. I want to know that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. I want to know Jesus in deep relationship. Then I want you to cry out to him right now. You can pray out loud. Man, that will encourage people around you. You can pray quietly in your mind or your heart. The Lord will hear you just as loudly. But just now, just in your seat, just say his name. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I cannot save myself. But I believe you can save me. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross in my place. I believe, Jesus, you rose from the grave on the third day. I believe that you ascended back to the right hand of God the Father in heaven. I believe in you, Jesus. And I'm asking you to forgive me of all of my sin, my stuff, my junk, my baggage. And clean me up from the inside out. Jesus, give me a heart that's pure and holy, just like yours. Save me today, Jesus. Save me. Give me the promise of heaven. Fill me with your spirit, God. Give me boldness and courage to live for you the rest of my days. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for saving me today. Help me to live for you, I pray.
Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, you really meant it. You, you're a son, you're a daughter of God, you're my brother, you're my sister. All the angels of heaven are rejoicing, and I want to have a, mo a moment, an opportunity just to celebrate with you. I wouldn't embarrass you for the world, but if you made that decision to follow Jesus today with your life, would you do me a favor right now? Would you just pop your hand up right over the house? Hold it up high. Hands up all over the house. Thank you, sir. Thank you, young lady. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Right here on the front row. Somebody else. Over this left side. Thank you. Right here. Two more. Three, four. Thank you. Thank you. Hands up all over this place, people. Thank you, sir. Trusting Jesus in this house today. Hallelujah. Hands up. Thank you. Right back down. I wouldn't embarrass you. I'm not calling you out. Celebrating with you today. A dozen people in this room. Praise God for what he's doing. Anybody else? Hand up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Somebody else? I just trusted Jesus today. I gave my heart to him. Mm. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit that draws people unto yourself. Thank you, Father, for the gift of eternal life that we can never work for, or earn, or deserve. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for heaven. Thank you for glory. Thank you for eternity, Father. Thank you for those today in this service who raised their hand in your presence and said, I choose Jesus. I choose the gift, yes, of eternal life. Hallelujah. We rejoice with all the angels and glory in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, church. Let's really celebrate new life in the house today. Amen. Come on now. Hallelujah. Wow. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for life. My soul. My soul. Man, look, I will never get over that. I'll never get over that. North Star, that's why we exist. That's why we're here. Life change, salvation, eternity. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today, could you just grab one of those little green and white connection cards in the seat pocket right in front of you? Uh, we just want to reach out to you and celebrate with you. Just give us a, a name, how you want us to reach out to you, an email, a phone, whatever is best for you. Uh, we just want to help you know how to take next steps. And just check the box, salvation. Today you gave your heart to Jesus. You are saved for eternity. Check baptism. We want to help you take that next step. Coming up real soon here at North Star Believers Baptist. Check baptism. And just drop it in the basket a little bit later when the offering comes around. Just so we can celebrate with you and reach out to you. Wow. Hey, but I'm not done with you just yet. For, for those of us who have been Christ followers, five years, decade, 20 years, 30 years, Here's what I want you to pray today. We are a church that believes deeply in the power of corporate prayer. We believe that when we pray together, the God of heaven hears us and begins to move on our behalf. And so I want to invite you to this altar today that's wide open for you to come and seek the heart of your Father, that he would free you from the bondage of self-righteousness. Make me approachable, God. Make me lovable, God. That he would free you from the bondage of relational fear, rejection, being a pleaser, that you can speak the truth in love, hard conversations, that God would free you today from unrealistic expectations. God, help me find joy in you and no one else and help me to release those others in my life from that pressure and that load. So that's what my desire is for us today, that we'd start a journey with the Lord today to properly align ourselves in relationship with His Word, that we would get healthy in our relationships and build other relationships that will last. And so I want to invite you. I'm going to pray, and then I want you to come and pray, be prayed for, be prayed over. Our pastors are here, elders are here, prayer warriors are here. That you just be the first person out of your seat. Run down here today. Stop worrying about what other people might think or do. It's so irrelevant, so unimportant today. You could just kneel in this altar. Come with a friend. Come with your spouse. Come with a life group member. Go to a pastor. Go to a pastor's wife. Ask somebody to pray for you. Pray over you. Start the journey today of getting your unhealthy relationships healthy and building healthy relationships that will last. Want to? Let me pray. Father, we pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you'd set us free, deliver us from the strongholds of the enemy. Lord, that no longer would we have unrealistic expectations of others. Lord, no longer would we live our lives in relational fear. Lord, no longer would we be people of self-righteousness. We'd stand in the righteousness of Christ. 
Lord, I pray right now that you would begin this process of drawing people, wooing people unto yourself. Lord, lead us today to fall on our knees in your presence and cry out for your help. Lord, may we be desperate for you in this moment. Set us free by the power of your spirit, we pray in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. We stand to our feet. Man, you step out. Come pray. Be prayed for right now. This is your moment as we work. Come on now. Let's pray. Come on. Step out. Be bold. Be courageous.